name is Tim Clark, and I am the chairman of the Greater Riverside Area Dickens Fellowship in Southern California. I'm also on the board for the Dickens Project for our wonderful Dickens Universe, which I look forward to attending every single year. So I can see all of you and exchange smiles and pleasantries and get caught up. I have chosen a little segment from the very conclusion of chapter 49 of David Copperfield. I am involved in a mystery. This is for our Dickens to go, which I have really enjoyed watching my peers offer their favorite passages from their favorite books and explain why. Now, my reason for choosing this little extract from chapter 49 it has to be pretty obvious. It involves Mr. Wilkins Micawber. And for those of you that have been around long enough, back in 2009, when John Glavin was writing and producing our Reader's Theater productions for Thursday night, I was cast as Wilkins Micawber. And it was a blast. And some of our cast members from that time still attend. Who can forget the lovely Sandy as my wife, Mrs. McCaw? Who can forget Ricardo and Tommy as the brain donkeys? <laughs> yes, it was a lot of fun. And of course, uh, John Glavin, who hasn't been attending for the last couple of years, uh, he was just a brilliant, brilliant man. I have always enjoyed Copperfield. I'm glad that we chose it again after just an 11 year absence. And now it'll be 12 by the time we really get around to it uh, next July. And I love Wilkins Macabre. You might see on the bookshelf behind me, I have one of Frank Reynolds' little caricatures of him resting on the top there. So let's go into this chapter 49. I'm involved in a mystery. And if you like to read along, it's near the end of the chapter. Go back a couple pages from the end. And the one quote you want to look for is Macabre's, where he says, my dear Copperfield, this is an occupation, OK? But let me give you a little uh, prelude to, so you know what's going on, what has built up to this uh, implosion. <laughs> uh, Mr. McCauver is visiting David, Betsy, and Mr. Dick and Betsy Trotwood's home. He has obviously been preoccupied and agitated with his thoughts throughout the occasion. Despite the light banter during supper, it is obvious to all of them that Macaver is having a very difficult time containing his emotions. And Betsy leans her elbow on the little round table that she usually kept beside her and eyed him attentively. Notwithstanding the aversion with which David regarded the idea of entrapping Macaver into any disclosure, he was not prepared to make voluntarily. David felt that he should have taken him up at this point, but for the strange proceeding in which David saw Macabre engaged. Thereof his putting the lemon peel into the kettle, the sugar into the snuffer tray, the spirit into the empty jug, and confidently attempting to pour boiling water out of a candlestick were among the most remarkable. David and Betsy saw that a crisis was at hand, and it came. Macabre clattered all of his means and implements together, rose from his chair, pulled out his pocket handkerchief, and burst into tears. My dear Copperfield, this is an occupation of all others. 
recline an untroubled mind and self-respect. I cannot perform it. It is out of the question. David says, well, Mr. Micawber, what is the matter? Pray, speak out. You are among friends. Among friends, sir? Good heavens, it is principally because I am among friends that my state of mind is what it is. What is the matter, gentlemen? What is not the matter? Villainy is the matter. <laughs> Baseness is the matter. Deception, fraud, conspiracy is the matter. <sighs> and the name of the whole atrocious mess is heat. Let's see, clapped her hands, and all present started up as if they were possessed. Macabre begins violently gesticulating the pocket handkerchief, fairly striking out from time to time with both arms, as if he were swimming under superhuman difficulty. The struggle is over. The struggle is over. I will lead this life no longer. I am a wretched being, cut off from everything that makes life tolerable. I have been under a taboo and that infernal scoundrel service. Give me back my wife. Give me back my family. Substitute macabre for the petty wretch who walks about in the boots at present upon my feet. And call upon me to swallow a sword tomorrow. And I'll do it with an appetite. They have never saw the man so hot in all their lives. They tried to calm him, but they might come to something irrational, but he got hotter and hotter and wouldn't hear a word of it. Macabre was gasping, puffing, sobbing to the degree that he was like a man fighting with cold water. I'll put my hand into no one's man's hand until I have blown the fragments the detestable serpent heap. I'll partake of no one's hospitality until I have I'm moved from Mount Vesuvius to eruption on the abandoned rascal heap. Refreshment uh, uh, underneath this roof, particularly punch, would uh, choke me unless I had previously choked the eyes out of the head of that interminable cheat and liar. Heap! Uh, I'll know nobody. And, uh, I'll say nothing. And I'll live nowhere until I have crushed to undiscoverable atoms the transcendent and immortal hypocrite and perjurer. Heap! David, Betsy, and Mr. Dick really had some fear of Mr. Micawber dying on the spot. The manner in which he struggled through these inarticulate sentences, and whenever he found himself getting near the name of Heap, fought his way onto it, dashed at it as if in a fainting state, and brought it out with a vehemence a little less than marvelous. It was frightful, but now, when he sank back into a chair, steaming and looking at his host, every possible color in his face that had no business there, and an endless procession of lumps following one after the other, and the hot haste upon his throat, whence they seemed to shoot up into his forehead. He had the appearance of being at the last extremity. David would have gone to his assistance, 
the macabre waved them off. He wouldn't hear a word. No Copperfield, no communication uh, until uh, uh, Miss Whitfield, a redress from wrongs inflicted by the consummate scoundrel. He they were quite convinced that Macabre could not have uttered three words, but for the wrongs and the afflicting energy from which this word he inspired him when he felt it was coming. Inviolable secret uh, 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 from the whole world. Uh, uh, no exceptions. This day, week, uh, at breakfast time, uh, everybody present, uh, including us, uh, uh, an extremely friendly gentleman to be uh, at the Hotel Canterbury, uh, uh, where Mrs. Micawber and myself, uh, old Lang Syne and Chorus, uh, yeah, and that will expose intolerable ruffian heap. No more to say or a listen and, and persuasion. Uh, go immediately. Uh, uh, not capable uh, uh, of their society upon the track of a devoted and doomed traitor. Hey! And with this last repetition of the magic word that had kept him going at all, and in which he surpassed all his previous efforts, Mr. Micawber rushed out of the house, leaving everyone in a state of excitement, hope, and wonder, but reduced present company to a condition little better than his own. But even in his passion for writing letters was too strong to be resisted. Well, while they were yet in the height of their excitement, hope and wonder, the following pastoral note was brought to them from a neighboring tavern at which he called to write it. Most secret and confidential, my dear sir, I beg to be allowed to convey through you my apologies to your excellent aunt for my late displeasure. An explosion of smoldering volcano long suppressed was the result of an internal contest more easily conceived than described. I trust I rendered tolerably intelligible my appointment for the morning of this day of this week at the House of Public Entertainment at Canterbury, where Mrs. Micawber and myself had once the honor of uniting our voices, yours, in a most well-known strain of the immortal excisemen nurtured beyond the truth. The duty done, a set of reparation performed that can alone enable me to contemplate my fellow mortal, I shall be known no more. I shall simply require to descend and to be deposited in that place of universal regard, where each in his narrow cell forever laid, the rude forefathers of Hamlet sleep with plain expression. Wilkin Macaw. <laughs> Thank you very much. And please check back again so you can see more episodes from our peers of Dickens to Go. Have a wonderful day. Bye.